Good morning, everyone. As you can see by the equipment in the back of the room, Richie Serrano is taping it. So if you all will please silence your cell phones. This is a record turnout. <laughs> But we want everyone to know in the other room that we are simulcasting this and they can ask questions of Mary. We have cards that are going to be passed back and forth so that everybody in the other room knows they can ask questions. Mary's happy to entertain questions after. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> and uh, this is our seventh exhibition. For Mary, we, this has been more, uh, more than 20 years of collaboration, which we're thrilled about. And we've published a 104 page catalog, which you've seen here and there, which references the work from the last five years. Um, it's warm in here, and I don't want to delay people any further, but just know that look, poke in every single place in the gallery, because we filled every place with Mary's new paintings on you held in collages. Mary Hartman. Thank you, Cheryl. I must thank uh, Cheryl and Kevin, Ben, Mary, Laura, Bruce, Todd. Uh, everyone who makes this place run makes my life very easy. And I'm totally grateful, even though I don't tell them often enough how grateful I am for what they do. That said, let me tell you about this dream I had. This dream. I know dreams of other people are usually very boring. <laughs> this dream does have a point. Nevertheless, you have to understand the arc of the dream. So. Uh, it's one of those dreams that I have rather often in which I am sort of winging it in a class. That so I'm not ready, I don't know what class I'm teaching, and I'm going to BS the entire thing. <laughs> now this is, not, this is not actually whatever happened. Of course, someone who gets ready for classes doesn't ever have this happen, which is why you dream about it not do it. Of course, there have been moments when I've had to make it up, but not that much. So I'm in a class, lovely room, normal students, 10% attentive. It's about the most you can hope for. <laughs> uh, and I am trying to figure out what I'm going to do in this class called painting. I'm apparently teaching painting. That I have figured out. There is a textbook which I did not choose. It's the first time I've ever seen it, and it's in shrink wrap. I've never even opened it. But I begin the class with some sort of nonsense in which I try to persuade the students that, as an aside to this class about painting, I want to talk to them about Gothic sculpture and how all Gothic sculpture is a result of, of uh, let's say, water falling downward. That is, it's all about the dripping of water. And I think I've been pretty convincing. <laughs> they show their normal level of appreciation of what I've done, which is almost nothing. And that seems right. So then there's a break in the class, which never happens, but it does in dreams. And I think, great, this is a chance for me to look at the textbook <laughs> so I can think of what I'm going to do next. So, I take the shrink wrap off the book and say, what is this all about? Someone has chosen for me a textbook called Learning to Paint from Mondrian. <laughs> and I think, learning to paint from Mondrian. I think I know what that's about. I know I'm going to open this book. I know what I'm going to see. This is a cinch. If you if you're going to teach learning to paint from Mondrian, you're going to open the book and it's going to have early Mondrian drawings and then Mondrian landscapes and then the eventual move of Mondrian into right angle uh, abstraction and you, you all know the Mondrian book. And so it must be that if I open the book, we're going to start with 
and one of those beautiful crisp pencil or ink drawings of an amaryllis with a long stem and then the flowers going out like this. And I don't know, am I going to ask them to do one of those? And then page over and there's going to be some slightly Art Nouveau influenced Dutch landscapes with rich dark colors and, and, and vertical lines. I said, well, you see, it's going to be the Mondrian thing. Here's the amazing fact. I open the book and it's not that. <laughs> Instead, it's this revealing book about real painting. And it has almost no text at all. I'm not even sure the, pain, the, the first images have captions. And I only get three pages of this book before I wake up. So it's really troubling. But it's a revelation. Whole pages of warm color, indistinct edged patterns of colors. Oranges, yellows, tangerines, reds all over the surface. That's, say, page one. I say, wow. Turn the page. The next page, same thing. More, more pastel, more mixtures with white, but uh, much of the same. Some tans coming in. Huh. I say, turn the page. Same thing except all the oranges, reds, and things have been joined by a couple of grays and blues in these same indistinct patterns. And over at the side are some very strong yellow lines beginning to work across the colors. Across, not around. And I think, oh, this is a book about painting. <laughs> this is a book about teaching you how to paint. Oh, what am I going to see next? Before I get to the next page, I wake up. <laughs> Therefore, I only know these three pages of learning to paint from Mondrian. <laughs> and they are so very refreshing in terms of the difference between what you might call the path of painting and the history of painting. History of painting is looking backwards at what you did, he did. We say, first there was this, then he did this. That must have meant this led to that. Then there was that, then there was that, then that led to that. Then that. That's your past. But this is about the path of painting now. That's what this book was about. This book may have been about how Mondrian actually made a painting, maybe only mentally. Maybe it was all the thinking in Mondrian's brain before the painting ever got structured. Maybe it was half of the structure, and the next pages would have been the other part of the structure. In any case, to start this way, with all of the patches of the colors that you wanted to use, seemed to me a completely logical way to start to teach painting. Because I think that this this concentration on a path is very much like what always happens when people work things out. You don't work things out by performing what you know is your historical duty. It is time now for me to transfer my interest <laughs> from landscape observation to a more abstract consideration of landscape. You don't perform your history. You work your way through relationships in one painting or in all of the paintings from one to the next. So that it's very much like, at least how I understand, um, quantum physicists work. I don't understand anything about how they work. But I have seen those blackboards. I've seen those blackboards in phonographs. I've seen those blackboards in movies. I've seen them in a few college campuses. Huge blackboards, lots of little formulaic writing, wiping out, changing the formula. Do you think those formulas are the performance of something the physicist already knows? Uh, I will show you in 4,200 steps how to get from A to B. 
that's not what they work out piece by piece what will go next. If this happens, can this, that, or that happen? Is that more likely? No, this stops that from happening. Okay, then it's this. It's step by step the relationship of, let's say, energy or electron powers to one another. As a matter of fact, I think, if I understand it correctly, this is what Feynman diagrams are about. The great physicist Feynman made patterns for, for other physicists to grasp about the possible paths uh, of decision making or energy transfers or whatever it is. They look like little diagrams with paths leading in different directions. Some squiggly lines, some lines that stop and start. All of these lines mean something. Those Feynman diagrams look to me a lot like what happens in a painting. One starts, works out this formula, uh-oh, that can't go anywhere. Then you must switch the direction and it must go this way. That's the true for in one painting, and it's probably true in a series of paintings. That the, that the solution in the formula works itself out through a process that's called a path, not a process that's called a history. So perhaps this dream book was showing us a proposition that began a Mondrian painting in Mondrian's mind and all of the alterations and path taking that had to happen in order for it to be a painting. This was one of those dreams in which you find out something you never knew before. Those dreams are extremely rare, as you know. Okay, so the kinds of paintings that you see, you might, you might have you might have decided while I was talking to you that actually I was just describing the way I paint. <laughs> um, and it has nothing to do with Mondrian or anyone who knew anything more about painting. Uh, but it's probably true. I, I was probably looking into uh, what my theory of how painting goes. What else could I have looked into on those pages? Um, I, I want to change, though, from the idea of how my process is, which is something that I'm not actually sure you can, you can or want to follow. If you want to follow it, you're crazy. Uh, if, you, if you can't follow it, good. That's, that's how it ought to be. But because that path of those, of those formulae on the board are not something I need to follow, I just need to know that the physicist worked it out in some way. If he worked it out, she worked it out in a way that is good for all of us, well, then I'm very happy. I'm glad it worked out that way. Um, but let's talk about how the paintings look when they get finished. There's this line that was said by the critic Peter Sheldahl, one of my favorites, Sheldahl. He writes for The New Yorker. He said in a, in a review about Franz Hals, the great Dutch painter Franz Hals, he said that he was ostensibly slapdash, meaning many people thought Franz Hals was slapdash. And Franz Hals, as we find out more in the Sheldahl review, Franz Hals actually made a career out of looking ostensibly slapdash. Franz Hals wanted uh, a kind of painting in which the paint strokes showed. And they showed in, in the way that perhaps suggested that Franz Hals had just tossed them off in one little mark. So people would say, oh, he tosses them off. <laughs> oh, they're, they're marvelous. And Schildel does attack Franz Hals a bit about this because he says Franz Hals never got past it. He always wanted to be the slapdashy, jolly Dutchman with everything going moving fast and being charming. Everyone happy, everyone drunk, everyone uh, pink cheeked and things um, at their best, at their dutchiness. <laughs> um, that's that's Sheldon just being mean about Franz Hals. Franz Hals probably wanted something 
uh, that I think is, a, is in the train of the things that I want. And that train starts in Western painting much earlier than Franz Hals. It starts in the late paintings of Titian, where Titian begins in the Renaissance to reveal the physical nature of paint itself as well as the subject, so that the hair of the Magdalene may look like choppy gold, but made out of yellow ochre as it falls down the side of the body. And people say, look at those brush strokes. Well, he's an old man, but it's charming. <laughs> he must be doing it on purpose. And little by little, there are more and more artists, including Franz Hals, including the people Franz Hals got this from, Rubens and Van Dyck, um, who start to talk about the nature of paint itself. And this pretty much reaches its apex in, first of all, Turner, the British painter in the 19th century, and then the oddity, the abstract oddity of the Impressionists, who want all the paint to show all the time, which is regarded as abhorrent at the time. Um, this train of thinking that the paint ought to show is probably mine. That is, I get very worried the moment the paint loses its nature and turns into something uh, other, like, like the emulsion of a photograph, not revealing itself. We know that you can do great painting, maybe greater painting, by losing the nature of the paint. In the very same article in which he's talking about Franz Hals, Schaldol talks about Caravaggio, whom, whom Franz Hals would have revered. Caravaggio as being frozen radiance. It is so smooth and yet so lively, it, it, it moves outward, but it's so smooth that when you look at Caravaggio, you don't think about the paint. You think about the beautiful light, you think about the surface, you think about flesh, fabric, color, but not about the paint. So Caravaggio's whole train of thinking is not that. The trouble with all of us who are paint, paint material lovers, like Franz Hals and me, uh, can't let it happen without being sad. In every painting that I make, I could pet it to death, as I sometimes told my students. I can take all of the gesture of the paint away, all of its physical body, until you see something that looks pretty smooth and solid. Won't be as good as a Caravaggio, I assure you but it'll be solid and I'll be miserable <laughs> because the paint no longer contributes to the mystery that you get to look at. Which brings me to my third, the thir third thing I want to tell you today. Um, I think that Fred Turner and maybe some other people uh, have said that the reason that I do this, uh, the, the allowing the paint to be itself, is that when you look at some of my paintings, you say, oh, it turns into a landscape. If I get close, I won't see it. This is a very common thing to say about an Impressionist painting, too. I'm not an Impressionist. Uh, close to an Impressionist painting, you say, oh, it's only dots. Back up, oh, it's, it's a landscape. That is perhaps a, an encouragement to you to examine your own levels of, of perception. What, how little stuff can I have and still read it as a sky? How little stuff can I have and still read it as trees? I don't need much. I carry, you, you carry inside your heads billions of visions of the world and you see a hint of one and you insert it into the work if you care to do so. So it is about your perception, but I'm almost never thinking about your perception. I'm glad the critics think, you, think I do. <laughs> I am examining your form of perception. Um, in fact, it's the paint that I want to be itself. There is, however, 
a kind of a kind of return to the idea of the first, the dream I told you about. Um, uh, I think somewhere else, I can't remember if it was Sheldell or not, somebody said that this kind of painting, maybe Franz Hall's kind of painting, is the streaming present tense, meaning it can't be put off into a solid thing. Your perception is always considered. Your present tense ability to find something that, isn't, that wasn't even intended, to find something that speaks particularly to you, your action as a perceiver is in the present tense all the time. So that painting that's like this allows the present tense to stream on. I really like that possibility as far as, say, my showing you your perception. OK, enough serious, heavy stuff. <laughs> what are some things that I can answer for you? One question we've been asked a lot is, in, when you look around the room, there's so many animals. Not house cats, though. Tiger, maybe. Mm -hmm. but Animals and there is various, a, there's a sculptural cat. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But but uh, people want to know what is it about the animals that endear them to you for compositions? Um, it's it is exactly this. Exactly this. Uh, because the paintings are uh, let's say suggestive rather than uh, than giving you orders about what to see, because the present tense is streaming. Perhaps you have a difficulty getting to know right away how to start. And it is exactly like that chorus member that comes down to the footlights in a Shakespeare play, that one unknown person guy, usually, walks down to the footnotes and says, footlights and says, oh, for a muse of fire <laughs> that could storm the heavens of invention. And you say, ah. So he's going to call upon the muses. Then he's going to tell us what the play is going to be about. Then the play is going to start. That's what that animal is, is the chorus at the footlights. So here, this is a painting called Normandy again. It's painted as a, as a response to a painting that was painted almost 20 years before it. And it's the same long, thin painting with the same, roughly the same scheme of colors, but very different. And this, in the other one, there wasn't one of these. There was a flower instead, but that wasn't a strong enough chorus member. In this one. <laughs> It, it's Normandy, remember, and Normandy is in France is full of foxes, and a fox here comes down to the footlights and he says, "Can this, can this, what is it called in, in Henry V? Can this, can this cockpit contain the vasty fields of France?" <laughs> and you say, "Well, the vasty fields of France." <laughs> That's the, that's the chorus member. And when you started this, you sent us photographs of the way it began. Mm -hmm. And you started it with bold gestural marks. Would, might that be the way that you put a matrix in for many paintings? Yes. Uh, the, it's very much like learning to paint from Mondrian. <laughs> The well-known text, learning to paint from Mondrian, put things down that, that are the, like tuning up the orchestra, put things useful down, like cast the play. This is, this is the chorus member. Here are the actors that, that are being introduced by that guy. Cast the play, put some stuff down. See if this person can act. If, if the person, if the character can't act, it gets obliterated. <laughs> That's, um, you know, fired. 
that's what happens in painting. You can, you can lie your way into the truth in painting. Yes? So if it's true you present, and as someone who you know, Bonar did the same thing. Oh, she says, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <laughs> when you're painting, uh, how do you know when to stop? Uh, should, should, when she's working on one, she even wants to fix it when she's already said it's finished. I say, Bonar did the same thing. Everybody does the same thing. There's a painting in this room that has one annoying section in it to me <laughs> that I, I can't get to to change it. But in, uh, all those changes are usually very small. Um, so usually I would say, Knowing when to quit is the genius of painting. If you know, if you know not to do one more thing just because you like it, I think I can make his hat more real. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's not a hat anymore. <laughs> that, that tendency to go on, that's the only thing I know. Geniuses know when to stop. Yes? I'm, I'm curious about how much planning goes into one of these. Do you, do you like work on more at, at one time? You do how much time at a time? Do you have work between Do you have a sketchbook? Do you just attack? <laughs> 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 That's a question. question. She's curious about how much planning goes into these things. Do I work on many at the same time? And do I plan for them? And well, there's, there's several ways to answer that. I, when people doodle on pieces of paper during boring lectures, um, I doodle, I doodle uh, compositional diagrams. So I can take the whole alphabet and, take, and make the alphabet into a series of paintings, maybe all of them square, and maybe then all of them rectangular. And, with changing different, or I can take the room and make it into. So there's a, in my head, there's a lot of compositional um, regular things. And I'm very anxious in painting not to do those. That is, to use them, but to do what's forbidden a little, pull things sideways, make things balance each other that aren't supposed to balance each other. So that's where, in the painting, the Feynman diagram comes in. Can I start this way? Can I make this work? Will this fail if I make this? What, what is the relationship? Oh, there's too much green in this painting. Um, this painting has no weight at the top. That there are four billion painter rules. Every, I mean, I forget. I forget three billion of them every day. And so, and I have to try to get them back. And the, it's much more easy to read those rules in other people's paintings than in your own. I can go to a painting in the Meadows Museum and say, ah, notice the rebatement. Notice the diagonal coming from the upper left. <laughs> notice the balance of the reds against side to side. Notice the orange is a weaker red used as the, and, and someone will say something that I hadn't noticed and I'll think, oh my god, that too, that too. Um, so it's easier to do that. And there's very little of that in my paintings. I will present you with this organization because those are all things that aren't very exciting. If it's, if it's already, if I can see it easily, it's not exciting enough. And another, another aspect of this question is how you use memory more than documentation like photographs. Because that it doesn't appear to be part of your methodology at all. Cheryl says that one of the interesting things is how much I use memory rather than, uh, uh, let's say, supporting documents. Um, yes. 
It is really true, however, that I have in my mind a right now for a painting that's on the studio wall, there mu there's got to be in the next mix a cabbage and a mouse. <laughs> and I know the mouse backwards and forwards. But the cabbage, it's very hard to think to, well, I remember all the cabbages from Whole Foods, but they're, they're extremely bald compared to those cabbages that are like roses. So how am I going to work out how fluty that cabbage is going to be? That I might need to look at a lot of cabbage photographs for. But in general, I'd say especially with landscape, when the characters in the painting begin to show me a place by their color or their shape, then I know what that landscape was because I've seen it. And my, my very favorite thing about the world is to stare at it. I stare at it all the time. There must be lots of little things stored away that are, oh, it looked like that in 1958. In, <laughs> the Black Canyon of the Gunnison when I fell out of the back of the Jeep. Yes, yeah, the, the greens were very dark. They were very dark. They were going upwards. And if that happens in the painting, I'll know what that is. There's a question from the other room about, tell us your attraction to Yuko paper. I, do I need to tell you this question or are you? Yes, tell us my attraction to Yuko paper. <laughs> Um, like all things that are easy to carry in painting, like canvas, which was invented for the same reason, Yupo is easy to carry. It's light. You can roll it up the same way you can roll up canvas. But the difference is, with Yupo, I don't have to gesso the surface in order to paint oil on it, because polypropylene, this archival polypropylene plastic, is impervious to solvents. So the solvents that are in the paint won't destroy the surface as they would in organic canvas. And, and it's merely a bow to the fact that I don't like soft surfaces. So I would always be putting the canvas or anything on the wall and then painting with the wall as the hard surface. But in this way, I have the easiest method of painting on a hard surface. If it's easy to roll up. It doesn't tear as easily as paper, although you can tear it. It's very strong, and it is luminous. It, it, its surface is not like gesso. I know a lot of you are big gesso experts, and there is a certain velvety loveliness to oil gesso. I know that in the other room, maybe even in this room, there happens to be a genius expert at oil gesso. So I won't denigrate it, <laughs> but it's not, it's not quite enough for me. I want that white light that's possible to bounce through the inside of the paint. Let's see. I believe Sandy had a question, and then there are these two questions. Was terrific performance of what the animals come down and how they cast. However, to me, I'm wondering, with you have a terrific sense of humor. It comes out in almost every one of your paintings. Why didn't you give them credit? You tend to give them the humor. The that's my question. Why, she is asking, I have, I, uh, in, in relation to the animals in the paintings, uh, this was a good performance, she said, about explaining about the <laughs> chorus coming down. But, and I have a sense of humor, but she asks, uh, why do I give the animals the credit? Is that what you're asking? Why didn't you? You gave them credit for commanding the manuscript, but they came to carry your humor. You can almost see them twinkle and, and wink, and I'd like you to talk about that. Well, I, I, she says, why do, why, um, they, seem, <laughs> they seem to carry all the humor of the painting. 
Guard dog. Yes. Guard dog, for instance. Uh, they carry all the humor. Well, that, of course, that's the job of the first chorus member is to quiet the audience down, tell, or perhaps tell some jokes. It's, that's the only character that is allowed, perhaps, to be funny. I don't know if any of you have seen in, in the movie Anonymous, there is a, a little piece of the great actor Mark Rylance playing the chorus member opening Henry V. And he is the funniest chorus member opening Henry V you have ever seen, including the audience in, back there in the globe. They're, they're delighted with the way he pretends to be a horse. Um, the, the animals are like that. Now, uh, I have been, I must say, about this sense of humor business. I think it is a mark against me in many areas. Not that I can help it. I can't help it. But um, I can remember giving a lecture at a Catholic university in New Hampshire once, in which uh, I, and I was talking about religious paintings especially of the Renaissance. And when I was finished, the, the priest who oversaw the school came and said, I had come pretty near to heresy <laughs> in making fun of the sacred people. Well, I was only talking about the characters in the painting, how, are, how robes are worn, how a gesture means or does not mean. I have no interest in denigrating St. Paul. It's not, <laughs> it's not my problem. He's fine. But I think, there's this, I think there is this uh, frivolous side, flippant and, and irreverent, that is a problem. We don't think it's a problem. Well, you're, you're Protestants. <laughs> okay, you had a question. I have several, actually. Um, well, this paintings on you, though. Yes, is it crackler that you get on canvas as they age? Crackler is a problem that comes sometimes from movement of the support, but also from layering. If you if you layer incorrectly in oil paint, if you paint lean over fat instead of fat over lean, you'll get it automatically. Um, I sometimes call for it in the painting and then scrub it off if it doesn't. These are very thin paintings, so they will not have that happen to them because I, I paint pretty thin. But that crackler is usually the problem of how you have layered the oil more than what the support is. If the support's flexible, you're going to get more of it. Let me keep doing that rolling these. Uh -huh. The other, nah, several questions. Another one is. Oh, we were, sorry, we were supposed to say, that we were asking questions about Crackler and its relationship to Yupo. Go ahead. <laughs> this is a very big piece of Yupo. Um, how do you, do you put it on the wall like this? Or do you put it on the floor? How do, you, how do you access? I mean, that's a, just a bunch of space there to access. She says this is a very big piece of Yupo that I'm standing in front of, so do I put it on the floor uh, or on the wall? It's, I, I want the hard surface of the wall, so I staple it to the wall. High, low? I mean, how do you so, reach? <laughs> well, so that I can reach all of it. <laughs> I make sure I can reach all of it. If I, I, I suppose it would be closer to the floor while I was painting it because I cannot necessarily reach that top. Um, but I, I put it on the wall and then I don't have any ladders or anything. I don't paint past what I can. But I would if I had, if Yupo came higher than 60 <laughs> inches, I would. Do you then repaint the wall before you paint the next one? No, the wall is covered with plastic so that my so that the guy who owns my studio building probably will not kill me when I move out. <laughs> it's covered with plastic, and then all the drips and all the extra things just gather on the wall. I'm able to keep things straight because things before were straight. 
It's very handy to have that grid of schmata or whatever you call it <laughs> on the wall. There's a photograph of Mary standing in her studio so you can see the background wall. With that painting in it, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, that brings up a question from the other room, which is why is it okay to have thin paint? <laughs> Why is it okay to have thin paint? Well, any kind of paint is okay. <laughs> um, uh, if, if it doesn't, it's even okay if it falls off, except when the dealer gets mad at you and your collectors get mad at you. I mean, it, paint is paint. You must let it be whatever thickness it must be for your painting. Everything is okay. But thin lets the light of the back show through the paint. Yes. Mary, could you please tell us about your cutouts and, and the, the painting that you do on the UFO and uh, do you have in mind what that cutout is going to be when you're painting the UFO before you cut it out and do you use the carving uh, Matisse method to cut out or just tell us about the cutout. Sally asked, tell us all about the cutouts. You actually seem to know something about how Matisse cut them out. which which I want to know <laughs> because I've seen Matisse's scissors and they are fabulous, those huge scissors of his. Um, I, cut, I have rules about how the cuts are made because it's similar to the rules about letting the paint show itself. But let's talk first about how the colors get on the surface. A lot of these are paintings that failed and became then cutouts. Therefore, I have lots of colors that I have no control over, and I have no control over really while I'm cutting them. I just cut, and whatever comes out is that wonderful accident that is much greater than that which you can plan. Accident is always greater than planning in, in art. So uh, my rule about cutting is that I can't have any interior cuts. There are no donuts with holes in them. There aren't any holes. And that um, I cut, usually counterclockwise, around the whole outside of a form without stopping. So that it's as simple a cut as you can make. And this is my uh, apology to all those magnificent Chinese tiny scissor cutters who, who, who go through the United States giving demonstrations, who can make whole the all of Noah's Ark with all of the animals, right? and it's all just fabulous. Um, that is sort of a facility is not mine. I, I want you to see a drawn line, as if you were drawing with a pencil. But there is no drawn line, because I just let the scissors do the cutting. So your, your eye follows the path of the, of the outside edge around. Yes? Acrylic and oil paint seem to be incompatible. This is a good question. Acrylic and oil seem to be incompatible, so how can you use them both in the same painting? Uh, acrylic is, dries faster than oil, and you can paint oil on top of acrylic, especially if it's not thick with r ridges in it, if it's thin. It can be used just like gesso, the surface of anything. You can't put acrylic on top of oil. You can put oil on top of acrylic. You can't put water-based things on top of oil-based things. But oil on top of water? Yes. And that's because the water has dried out, and it's just a colored surface. This, he, this, by the way, this thing is neither. This is, uh, well, it's acrylic, but all this beautiful gray stuff is powdered graphite, which is the purest carbon there is. And it just comes as a black powder, and you mix it with acrylic matte medium, and then put it on, it won't come off. You put it on with water and it'll just fall right off. It needs a binder. But it's a magnificent gray drawing material. Much more um, slow and gray and handsome than straight drawing with ink, which could do the same thing. And it won't do the same thing in oil? 
oil would do something and more like this than ink would, but less fun than graphite. <laughs> You said that you go to the museum. Yes. Very frequently. Are there paintings we're likely to find you in front of at the Dallas Museum or the Meadows Museum or the Kimball that are the paintings that you go to visit on a regular basis? And should we as the audience be at the museum as often as we can? She says, what about the museum? And what are my favorite paintings in all the museums around town? I, I have different ones, different days, but, I, and should we be in the museum last question first? Of course, mm -hmm. if, if I, I told my students that we ought to post above the classroom door, it's the museum, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a question, the museum has the answer. Somebody did it. You can go find the way it was done by somebody much better than we are. Usually. In the museum, by the way, the great thing you learn about the museum is not everybody's better than you are. In the museum. It's such great news. Most of them are. Uh, in, the, in the Meadows Museum, the, my absolute touchstone favorite is the Madhouse at Saragossa, or as it's now called, the, the Cloister of Lunatics, or whatever the new title is. Um, the little Goya, this big, painted on tin, of, the, of members of a madhouse. It's, it is a picture of the entire world, all its madness, so beautifully painted. It also has, it also has a cryptogram of a rat's head in it, which I discovered. <laughs> and I'm sure Goya did not intend. Um, but when you stare at something long enough, you find other things. That, that's why you go. Um, I do love, in the, in the DMA, I do love that um, oh, portrait, the portrait of the lady in the chair. Um, oh, I can't remember who the artist is. Bellows. The, the woman, his wife in the chair with the pink and blue dress and the acid yellow hose and the whole thing is astonishingly unpromising when you see it. You say, well, I don't know. And then you find out all the ways in which it is figured out in terms of color and composition. Magnificent painting. The Kimball, well, uh, the Bonar. Now that they own the Bonar, the view at Le Canet, which is the best Bonar in 40, 40 states, for sure. And on the cover of the catalog is Mary's response to the Bonar. <laughs> that Bonar in the Kimball is perfect. There, the Kimball has many perfect paintings, but now it has a new perfect painting. Um, and, and I do love, even though it's around the corner and often not seen, the Melissa Miller in the Fort Worth Modern, the, the whole scene of the animals. I love Melissa Miller's work, so. Don't let me go on. <laughs> Are there any questions from the other room? Maybe one should ask. Well, other room. Are there no more questions? I see a hand there. Simple question. Um, you thin your oil paints. Do you ever just use water to thin? You can't thin oil paint. She said, do I ever use water to thin my oil, pa oil paint? You can't I use. No. <laughs> you, although you would get some pretty frisky results. It, uh, they, it would be, uh, it would have what Kevin Vogel would call inherent vice, <laughs> which means it's going to fall apart. What do you thin with? You thin oil paint with either turpentine or mineral spirits, solvent. The solvents that make you stupider as you go, go along. <laughs> uh -huh. Solvent. Yes, that's what oil, oil is. 
you have to be careful when you work with it. There's many much more dangerous things to work with than oil paint. Well, if there are no more questions, Mary will be here for a while. If you'd like her to sign a catalog or to ask her a question, you will see a sign that says the garden is closed, but you may go back from the garden. Oh. We have one for you too. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you.